thanks everyone. Um, thanks for joining. And thanks uh, Future Day, uh, organizational team for, for setting this up. Um, um, like uh, Rashan said, the theme for today is river basins and energy systems. What synergies are possible and, and how can they be discovered? And this is um, what I'll be showing today is mostly work um, that has, we've been doing in, in the past couple of years on future dams. And future dams stands for design and assessment of water, energy, food, mega systems. Um, it doesn't only or doesn't necessarily stand for um, dams, the, the engineering structure. And the talk I'll give today is partially um, taken from a talk, the, the, a keynote talk that we were able to invited to give at um, Hydro 2020, which is a hydropower conference um, just last week, uh, which I gave with Mateo Spantelli, who's um, a, a academic professor in uh, power systems engineering and uh, is working with me and a whole large group of people who all show towards the end of the talk uh, in this work. So um, Future Dams is a really exciting project, four-year project, uh, almost 80 um, academics and, and um, practitioners working different places in the world. Um, we have, there, there's four, in, in, related to the work that I'm going to show today, there's four major case studies. Um, the West African one, which I'll talk about a lot today, looking at the Volta Basin, the East African case study, which is looking at the East African power pool and the uh, Eastern Nile Basin, especially a Middle Eastern case study, looking at the Tigris Euphrates Basin, and then a Myanmar study looking at the Irrawaddy River Basin and the national power system. Um, we also have work in India, but that uh, won't involve modeling, so it's less related to what I'm showing today. Um, so integrated water energy systems. This is something that's um, become relatively high on the agenda. There's, as you know, it's, flex, it's um, fashionable to talk about something called the nexus of water, energy, food. So the connections between these. And just uh, recently, I read an article in, um, I think, Power Magazine about how it's predicted that the, uh, the demand for renewables is going to increase the intensity of the water energy nexus. And what that jargon means is that as scarcity increases, there's going to be more calls for better management and um, synergi synergetic management um, between water energy and food. So um, typically until now, these systems, river basins and energy systems are typically managed and planned really separately. Um, and in terms of, so, you know, these are complex, large spatial supply demand systems. So they often use, um, often mathematical models or computer models are used to improve the management of these. And so um, their, their um, power system models will typically treat water as a fixed input without really considering its variability. Water system models will typically allocate water to hydropower, but without considering really the energy needs at any particular time. Um, and just in general, the temporal and spatial synergies between the systems aren't considered. So are there benefits to an integrated approach? That's uh, one of the main questions that Future Dams is asking. So the approach I'll be showing today is uh, relatively simple. You can see no equations, just uh, three bullet points. Uh, it's a simulation based approach. So, you know, for complex human environmental systems, the resource, whether it be natural or engineered, is distributed over space and time. And so there's really no easy way to get your head around that. The only easy way to do it, and the one that's been used over the last 50 years, is to um, use simulation models. And a simulation model is just a computer attempt to kind of do bean counting. Um, so you, you just track water volumes and energy production over space and time and just count the benefits where they accrue. So uh, financial benefits, economic benefits, environmental benefits, um, engineered system reliability, so it's levels of service benefits. There's all kinds of uh, costs and benefits to these uh, resources as they're distributed over space and time. And so what we're doing in, in, the, in the, the simulation is just tracking. We're just uh, accounting. Second approach is, uh, or the second part of the approach, the second method is quite exciting. 
because this is something that didn't really exist when I did my PhD um, finishing in 2007 in California. Um, there's this whole new crop of artificial intelligence uh, search algorithms that find uh, efficient and clever solutions to big problems. And you just connect your simulators to those and they do the optimization, the search for you. So it's just like Googling your system to find out good solutions. It's not that hard to do and it's really effective. So I'll be showing some results of that search. And then the final one is deliberating. So the search, because it's multi-objective, it doesn't give a single best solution. It gives a trade-off between very efficient solutions. Um, and those trade-offs will depend on how you'd like to allocate benefits and costs to different sectors and regions of your water energy system. So there's plenty there to deliberate and to negotiate with. So that's the third step of this process. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, quickly on tools, quite a, uh, you know, some of you are be, you know, sort of technical modeler uh, types. And so you'll, you'll wonder, okay, well, if you wanna map model at national scale, a water system, a river basin with all its sort of hydro environmental social complexity and the power system, how, how do you do that? Well, we use a simulator. So the, fir the, the one that we use for water is called PyWR. The publication is there below. Uh, what's nice is that it's a very fast simulator. It's also open source. And the link to multi-objective optimization or search is included inside of it. So that's a, a really nice tool that we've recently published that, um, that the, the UK water supply industry is also increasingly using, including to build a national uh, supply demand model of England and Wales. So it's an exciting tool. It's been used by all sorts of uh, groups. And so uh, that's what we use for the river basin simulation. For the energy system simulation, we have a few of these. Um, the one that we're using now is a, is a fast generalized uh, spatial power uh, system simulator. It also links to the objective optimization and it can model uh, like at the hourly time step uh, sequences of time, or it can also do simpler uh, represent, rep representative days type um, modeling. And it will simulate the unit commitment in, in power systems. Okay, and so those are, those are existing technologies used over the last 40 years. Um, in 2018, we, we, well, we published in 2018 a framework that we had been building for five years, which we designed for a case study in Jordan. We were trying to model all the water users, water producers, and water-related institutions in Jordan in a sort of environmental, socioeconomic engineering model of that country's water resource systems. And we realized there is no software method or framework to do this kind of modeling. So we invented one, it's called PINSIM, which, which stands for Python Network um, simulation framework and it's also open source and it allows you to do just what this figure shows which is you have an independent power system model an independent river basin model and they interact they interact by with hydropower that's what they have in common and so you're able to just use those two models independently keeping all of their accuracy and the sector's famili familiarity with it but you're able to connect them at runtime which means you're able to do integrated modeling. So, um, so, okay, so that was the first part of our method. The second part was search. And so I always show this really simple um, diagram of what, what is, what is multi-objective search, multi-dimensional search or multi-objective optimization. What does that mean? Well, you can understand it by just looking at this, uh, this drawing. Imagine you uh, plotted all the houses on the market and you plotted their distance to work and their cost and you can see here that um, there, there's a, well, there, there's all these blue points are the houses, but um, there's a special set of houses, which is these red ones, which for any distance to work, it's the cheapest house. And so that, an, an economist would call that the Pareto optimal set of houses and a engineer would call it the non-dominated set of houses. And someone off the street would just call it, those are good houses that you should have a look at. So we use that final definition and the whole the search I'm gonna be showing you this optimization results, the search results are just gonna be showing you those, those outside red points because they're ones that are efficient or that make sense. Okay, let's uh, go straight to a case study. So um, 
let's look at the integrated national uh, water and river basin and power system of Ghana. Uh, you can see there's a really large uh, reservoir lake there. It's called Akasumbo Reservoir. Um, it was built, um, you know, in, in 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and it, provide, it provided at some point in the beginning most of the, the power supply of Ghana. Um, we also have represented in black the the power the national power system in sort of its at that high level scale. Um, so this is the system that we're representing, and there's considerable challenges like there are in many places in Africa. There's uh, just uh, development is happening. The populations are growing, and it's increasing the, the demand on water and energy resources. So. The next thing we consider here is the color represents the solar potential. So you can see the north is quite dry with a lot of solar potential, and the south is a little bit less, uh, has a little bit less potential for solar power, um, but it's where most of the demand is. So load is how power systems engineers talk about demand. So the energy demand is represented by these big square, uh, these big round black dots. So the question we have is pretty simple is how to meet future energy demands while producing less emissions than today. That's a big goal of future dams is how can these water energy food environment mega systems, how can they be transformed and help reach societal goals like net zero? So that's what we're doing in this case study in Ghana. And these results are just brand new from the last couple of weeks. So we haven't been able to interact with many people in the consortium with them, but I'm just gonna give some very initial uh, results. So the design problem that we set up is um, giving the activation of a little bit of wind energy, but especially this um, um, solar energy, and that solar can be distributed anywhere in that grid. So the search algorithm will, will decide where it's most advantageous to put it. Well, it, it will try out many options. And then the other decision is where to expand the, the power grid system to accommodate all of that new solar power. And then the final decision is how to operate all the reservoirs in the whole country. So this is, this is as you can see, a really energy system design problem, which really hasn't been in the past in that we're making just the entire power mix, the entire energy mix and the entire um, water management system up for grabs. And so the simulator is just going to try different options and it's going to uh, identify for us those that meet these objectives. So you can see it's trying to minimize costs, uh, minimize the curtailment of, so mi minimize missing out on, on meeting the energy demands, minimize emissions, uh, minimize environmental disruption in the rivers, and then maximize some agricultural um, benefits. So that's the design. Then we're going to try, um, we're going to look at allowing this, this automated computer search to consider different amounts of, of solar expansion. So if you really allow the investment in uh, transmission lines, um, how does that affect this, this problem? Okay, so here are some summary results or here are some initial results. So this is the this is the traditional way that Akasumbo, Akasumbo, like I showed you, was that huge dam that covers a large part of the country or a significant part of the country. Um, and what you're seeing here is that fundamentally what the um, Akasumbo is providing is base load. So it's always producing quite a bit of megawatts there. It's always on and it's always producing energy. Uh, you can see that there's a little bit of flexible operation. That's where you get that orange stain or the orange lines going up and down. That means the, the, you know, the reservoir is either releasing, it's increasing and reducing its, its releases, for example, to accommodate and to generate uh, power system flexibility in the, in the power grid, because hydropower can do that, can turn off and on very quickly. And if you optimize it purely to enable solar power adoption, what happens is this blue, right? So here we're looking at, and I should have mentioned this before, we're looking at two years of operations of Akasumbo, so the, the amount of hydropower generation. And what you can see with the blue is that, well, it's, it's creating, well, there's more hydro, there's more, um, there's more power being generated. But these, the reason why there's, there's a lot of blue here is that the hydropower plant is turning off 
phenon because level and then off, uh, sorry, on is a high level, a high number, and off is a low number. So the, the blue line is going up and down. And so the, the hydropower is turning off and on. So what's happening here is that we're reoperating the whole system to enable the solar power, the renewables, but the solar power is only emit during the day. So the hydropower is turning off and on, you know, to accommodate the solar. So you can imagine that for the environment, it's not great to have like daily floods and droughts. Um, so clearly there, you know, there, there's some things that, you know, we can't 100% operate hydropower just to enable renewables. We're going to have to, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. And of course, uh, the, here I mentioned some of the services that hydropower provides. So it's um, in terms of flexibility, it's giving frequency control reserve and load balance. So it's helping the grid work basically. Um, and on the medium to long term, it's, it's also providing all sorts of services. So that's what's being optimized here. Um, this is a different way of looking at results. And, but it's the same concept. So remember when I showed you that, um, that set of red points, the search engine was in a, simulating the integrated system and it was trying to identify some points that work well. Well, this is exactly the same thing, except here, rather than looking in two dimensions, you're looking in five dimensions or six dimensions. So this is obviously a little bit harder to digest, but let me just, you know, if you stick with me here, um, the, so here we have six performance metrics and a perfect functioning system would be a, a green line or a line across the top, right? So that would have great load curtailment. So it would never, it would always be meeting all the energy demands. It would be producing very little emissions. It would have low operating costs and it would have a low hydro, hydroecological alteration. So it wouldn't be uh, disturbing the river because it wouldn't be, you know, it would, it would mimic the natural river flows and it would have a lot of intermittent renewables and it would have, it, the, there would be no transmission cost expansion. So it would be free, right? It would be costless in terms of infrastructure. Unfortunately, we all know that in this life, you can't have everything you want. So you can't, you can't have a perfect system. So there's no line across the top there. Um, you can see here my, my Y axis label is this arrow of preference. So a good solution is towards the top of the plot. And so unfortunately you can see here that there are trade-offs when the, when the, so what we've done here is that, okay, why are there, there's lots of designs, which are all these gray, all these lines are all different designs of the system. But um, you can see here that I put a little filter where you can see in the, in the middle axis where it says hydroecological metric alteration. There's a little gray bar here um, and I don't know if people can can see my pointer. Here we go. Oh, uh, ten little options. Okay, I should have uh, should have studied how to do this highlighter pen. Okay, well, there's a okay. It looks like I have a very small little red dot here. Uh, hopefully, you can see that. Um, so the, you see here this little gray line. I've put a little filter, which is showing where the hydroecological alteration is 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 favorable and so you can see so what this plot now that i've explained the plot i can tell you that this is talking about base load operation so this is the way akasombo has been managed in, in the past and you can see that it's hydro the the hydro ecological performance the alteration is low and so it's performing well that's why we're in this little filter up here what's happening though is that the intermittent renewables are not so great so it's producing largely using thermal and other resources the operating costs are high the emissions are quite high and the load curtailment is quite unfavorable so there's a substantial amount of of energy demand which is not met so if we switch this around and you can see here that my little filter i'm now choosing those so remember each one of these lines represents a way to invest and, and manage the system that are that is efficient or Pareto optimal. Remember those red points. So all of these gray lines are, and the colored lines are equally good. It's just a question of what trade-off do you want to embody? So if we move, if we move the selection to the ones which perform unfavorable here in hydroecological alteration. Um, you can see that we're then able to have much better load curtailment emissions, operating costs, and intermittent renewables. 
And so you can see right away there that there's a, there seems to be a, a significant trade-off between the, the hydroecology and the ability to, for the Ghanaian power system to take on new solar power. So that appears unfortunate, um, but you know, what can be done? So, well, one thing that can be done is to invest in more solar power and to connect that solar power to the big cities in the south of Ghana. And that's what these, these points that have been selected here are doing. Because you see that the solutions I was showing before had very little transmission grid expansion. Whereas if you look here on the right, we have a huge amount of transmission line extension, which I'm circling here on the right. It's the, the axis on the far right. So by, by investing in all that transmission grid, what we're able to do is, is take some of that solar power in the north of the country and have that solar power work proactively and synergistically with the hydropower to enable to just increase the performance overall. You can see here that our load curtailment, our emissions and our operating costs have gone to very favorable levels. And our hydroecological um, at, um, metric has really improved. Um, now imagine that this transmission program was just too ambitious and expensive. Well, imagine you just said, okay, what if I, if you just allow me to expand that transmission grid just a little bit um, so that I can bring on more solar? Well, then it would look, sorry, wrong way. It would look like this, like this plot here. So you can see here, I have this filter on the right and I've just allowed a little bit of, you see that gray box. Um, I've allowed just a little bit of transmission line expansion. And you can see that that allows these red lines to become active, which are ones that um, you see the color red means that there's a lot of uh, lines or there are lines that are the, the expansion of the, of, this, um, of the power grid to accommodate solar has been allowed. And so you can see that by going for red, by expanding those power lines to accommodate the solar, I'm able to just do better overall. All my metrics become better. As you can see, the red lines are closer to the top. So anyways, I've shown you all the gory details here. Um, hopefully that hasn't been too overwhelming. That's kind of the end of the technical part of the talk. Well, there's also this, but you know, I'm gonna skip these slides because we're already at 22 minutes. Um, but the bottom line is here, if you look at this table here on the right, um, the first column of numbers is the historical operating rules. And the, the second column of numbers, which I'm circling now, is the one where you use, where you specifically invest in the solar system in such a way as to optimize it with the hydropower system. And you can see bottom line is that my thermal generation, so my use of petrol or gas is going from 40%, 46% of the national energy mix to 38%. And so I'm able to, I think in the best case, we were able to reduce about 6% the national emissions. So that's exciting. Just by building this model that represents both water and energy, we're able to um, reduce emissions by 6% with relatively small investments in new solar transmission lines. So in terms of this Ghana case study, a few things were shown. Um, the change in the way we use hydropower enables more solar and less thermal generation, reducing CO2 emissions. The hydropower allows moving water in time to respond to changes in net load, so the energy demand and solar availability. There's a emissions reduction and hydrological alteration trade-off. And that's something that needs to be managed, but this approach shows that you can, you can manage that. Um, and then we showed that connecting the high solar potential in the North to the big demands in the South really improves the, the way the system can function. So this is the kind of result that you can get from these uh, water energy uh, modeling studies at national scale. You can really figure out how to optimize your national river basin energy system to reduce renew uh, to increase renewables, reduce emissions, reduce costs, and also be whilst being very careful about your hydrological changes or your environmental changes. Um, one exciting, so now I'm just, um, that's it for the modeling. Um, I'm just going to show you now just a few slides of general interest. Um, one thing that's nice about this project is that um, we, well, not only do we use open source simulators, which our, our country partners can, can adopt in the future, 
Um, but we, but the the mod, these integrated river basin energy models are deployed online, so that we we can work collaboratively with our partners to improve the model. And basically, there's few barriers to use. So here's the the integrated power water system of Ghana with the power system in red, and the river basin system, the Volta River in gray. So that's a neat um, facet of that study. Um, I'm not going to show you results from other case studies, but I did want to show you that we're working in other places. One of the exciting places we're working on is the Eastern Nile, or sorry, the Nile River in East Africa. And that's just an exciting system for so many different reasons, one of which is this new reservoir that you can see here called the GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is a large, very expensive new res hydropower reservoir that Ethiopia has built at the border. And this is a a concern for the downstream countries, how it will impact um, their economies and their, their environment and resource systems, both energy and water. So that's something that we're actively working on. Obviously, I don't have time to show you results there, but we, we just have some results that came out. Um, here's the website that shows our Eastern Nile model. Um, you can see there's a lot of detail there. And this allows us to work on a daily basis with our colleagues at the Nile Basin Initiative and at the East African Power Pool um, in a bit the same way as we're able to work with colleagues in Ghana. Because the models are hosted online, we really are able to interact frequently and in a very precise way. So that's really useful. And so, you know, it makes for, you know, here's some detail. You can see that these, um, because we have this very computationally efficient simulation models, we're able to create these simulation models that have a, quite a bit of local detail. Um, and we anticipate that that'll be very helpful. Um, here's a, a, one of the initial results that we got, um, just showing that we imagine if you put a lot of floating solar on the High Aswan Dan in Egypt, um, you know, how that would affect the river levels uh, in Egypt uh, in the High Aswan Dam. And this was just looking at a historical scenario. So this is the kind of, of study that we'll do, of course, is that looking at investments and different modes of management of the East African water energy system, how can you impact the, uh, the resource availability in all of those East, East African countries. Um, an exciting other thing we're doing here in collaboration with our colleagues at UCL, University College London, is that um, in this in this case study, we're uh, focusing not only on connecting the water energy systems, but also on connecting economy models, whole economy models. So that's what that left box here means. It's a uh, whole economy model, and we're connecting it to the uh, river basin simulation. And so that allows all sorts of the simulating how different uh, management and different investment in the river basin energy and energy system could translate to economic, socioeconomic impacts like employment or um, gross, dom uh, gross domestic product. So, you know, economic indicators. Um, we also have a, a case we're working with YTU, Yangon Technological University, some uh, national and, and ministerial groups looking at how to rethink the Myanmar uh, energy water system. And so here's just uh, early screenshots of, of that of the website that shows that model. And so that's an exciting um, project that we're doing. And we're very lucky to have Professor Ung Se Ya, who works with us quite um, intensively on that on that project. So uh, again, some great, uh, some great collaborators there. Um, here's just a quick uh, slide of um, a lot of the partners that we have. The top row is in Ghana and the Volta River Basin. The middle row is our colleagues uh, working intensively with us these days on these river basin models and power system models in, um, in Myanmar. And then in the bottom row, we have some colleagues at the Nile Basin Initiative and its uh, Eastern Nile Technical Office and um, the East African Power Pool. Um, here are just a few of the UK researchers. These are this is not an exhaustive list. These are the ones that have directly, because we had so many that we, we, we couldn't fit their pictures in. So the ones pictured here are the ones who have just um, 
contributed in the results that I specifically showed today. In the future, this group will increase very much, but um, right now these are to have um, helped generate the results today. Uh, and finally, this is my last slide. Um, there's a few papers in progress, but this is one that's quite nice. It's open access and it gives a summary of the decision-making framework. And so you're welcome to, to show that, uh, to, to have a look at that. So I've spoken 30 minutes. That's a bit more than I would have hoped, but I think that's still within the allowable amount. So thanks for that and look forward to any uh, comments and questions.